So good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Freed. I'm solicitor for Euclid Township. We are here tonight on a continuation of a conditional use application of Audubon Management Corp um, related to um, a uh, development in Euclid Township. Um, before we get started, um, I'm going to ask Council for the, the two parties to introduce themselves and who they're representing. Bernadette Kearney from Hamburg Rubin here on behalf of the applicant. And Steve, Steve, Steve Buck from Stevens and Lee on behalf of uh, JW Pepper and DFT Inc. All right, good, good evening, everybody. Um, so I just have a couple preliminary matters and then we can move back into the testimony. First, um, and Ms. Kearney, you and I uh, discussed this um, probably a month ago now, if, uh, if I can remember. Um, on the, when you um, granted an extension for the hearing on July 13th, 2020, the way the letter was written is you granted a, um, extension to October 31st, 2020, to have the initial uh, hearing and render a decision. And I just wanted to clarify that that extension was to have the initial hearing. The, the uh, decision will come within 45 days of the closing of the record. Is that right? Yes. And if you need me to clarify that in a letter, I can do so. No, this is fine. We're okay. on the record. Thank you. Yes. Um, and then... I do have some additional exhibits to go over, um, board exhibits. Um, last time we got to exhibit um, B16, B15, so I'm gonna start with B16. We have the um, hearing notice for this continued hearing. Um, which is today, October 27th, 2020. I turn my have the proof of publication in the daily local news that ran on October 12th, 2020 and October 20th, 2020. We have the uh, list of abutting property owners who were notified. We have, um, which is B18, and I'm sorry, B17 was the proof of publication and B-16 was the hearing notice. B-19 is the BOJA engineering review letter dated October 8th, 2020. Um, Mr. Buck, I assume you're gonna be using that as an exhibit and marking it as an exhibit. We're, we're including it just to give context to the next exhibit I'm gonna mention, which is exhibit B-20, which is a McMahon Associates memorandum dated October 20. 2020, which was commenting on the BOJA engineering review letter. Um, are there any objections um, to the admission of those exhibits? No objection. No objection. Okay, then they'll be admitted. And uh, Ms. Kearney, you can call your next witness. And the next witness will be the traffic engineer, Eric Ostenchuk, who I believe is on the line. Yes, good evening. Yes. Great, if we could have Eric sworn in. Lorraine, you might be on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Do you soundly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Yeah. And Eric, can you uh, please state your name and spell your last name for the record? Yes, Eric Ostomchuk, last name spelled O-S-T-I-M as in Mary, C-H-U-K. And by whom are you employed? Traffic Planning and Design Incorporated. And can you please describe what you do for your employer? 
Uh, yes, I'm the Vice President of Transportation Planning, and in that role, I oversee uh, the Transportation Planning Department, which prepares the majority of our transportation impact studies uh, for private clients. And are you a professional engineer? Yes. And can you describe what the PTOE means uh, behind your, your name? Yes, that's a, an additional uh, licensure through the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and it stands for Professional Traffic Operations Engineer. And your um, CV is Exhibit A17 in our um, exhibit booklet, correct? Yes. And can you briefly describe for the board your educational background? Yes, I have a BS in Civil Engineering from Widener University. And can you briefly describe your employment history? Yes, so I've worked uh, as a transportation engineer for 22 years, mostly within the private development community, providing uh, transportation impact studies for all manner of projects from residential to warehousing, retail, uh, from a few thousand square feet to over two and a half million square feet in size for projects. And can you please give some examples of the representative types of projects and nearby projects that you have worked on in the past few years? Certainly, I've worked on uh, some distribution warehousing in uh, Southern Chester County, uh, as well as York County. Uh, the majority of the ones we handle are in uh, Berks County and, and up in the Lehigh Valley along the Route 78 corridor. Um, in the township, I've uh, prepared uh, traffic studies and evaluations within Eagle View for retail uh, portions along Route uh, 113 near Eagle, Eagle View. Uh, nearby in the region, I've, I've worked uh, in the Great Valley Corporate Center for uh, Liberty Property Trust for a lot of their buildings, as well as Atwater, which was an over $2 million, uh, 2 million square foot uh, facility uh, right near the Turnpike on Route 29. And have you previously testified before zoning hearing boards or municipal bodies? Yes, many. And have you previously been accepted as an expert witness before those municipal bodies? Yes. And what type of expert? Uh, in transportation planning and traffic engineering. And uh, Mr. Freed, I'd like to offer Eric as a uh, transportation planning and traffic engineer expert. Mr. Buck, do you have any objection or voir dire? No, thank you. All right, thank you. We will accept um, uh, Mr. Asenchuk as a uh, expert in transportation planning and traffic engineering. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Asenchuk, did you prepare a transportation impact study? Yes. And that has been marked as exhibit tab A4 um, as part of the applicant's exhibits? Yes. And uh, just to let the board know, the transportation impact study that was made part of the uh, applicant's exhibits, we it did not include the appendices with that because they were so large and it made it more difficult to bring it up on the screen. But the appendices were provided as part of the conditional use application when the impact study was filed with the conditional use application, correct? Yes. And again, that's uh, exhibit tab A4. And what was the purpose of the study? Uh, the purpose of the study was to evaluate the traffic impact associated with the proposed use uh, to determine if adequate facilities are present to accommodate the traffic and if not to determine what uh, roadway improvements would be necessary to offset any impact. And um, could you describe for the board how you're familiar with Euclid Township? As I described previously, I've prepared studies uh, within the township uh, nearby, and I uh, should also note that uh, my company, uh, Traffic Planning and Design, is the traffic engineer in neighboring West Whiteland Township as well. And uh, what we're all viewing on this screen is the conditional use plan, which I believe had been marked exhibit um, applicants A2, and I believe the um, yeah, it's, it's applicants A2. I'm not sure if the township also marked it. Um, can you describe the access, can you describe the existing site and access to the site? Yes, certainly. The uh, proposed site is bordered on the bottom of the screen by Route 100 uh, to plan left uh, and to the plan top. It's bordered by the turnpike and the subsequent uh, interchange and to the plan right 
I would call it south, I guess, would be uh, bordered by Sherry Boulevard. Access to the site is proposed via two access points. Uh, you can see them, the pointer there. That is the main access point that is closest in proximity to Route 100. There's also an additional access point, uh, secondary uh, provided to Sherry Boulevard, uh, call it to the east, uh, eastern edge of the site. Um, those are the two uh, main access points that we evaluated in our, our transportation impact study. Uh, it should be noted that the applicant <clears throat> is endeavoring to pursue a connection to uh, the turnpike ramps, which is plan left as noted on the screen here. Um, we did not consider that connection in our transportation impact study uh, simply because we don't control the outcome of that pursuit. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the uh, intersection of Sherry Boulevard and Route 100 could handle the traffic associated with the site should that connection um, not be made. But we certainly plan to pursue that connection uh, as an uh, egress for uh, vehicles going to the uh, turnpike. And uh, you, who would you pursue that with? That would be with the uh, Turnpike uh, Commission. Um, we've, uh, in our reviews, and we'll get to it later in testimony, I'm sure, but in our reviews uh, by the township and by PennDOT in the materials that we supplied them, and in our transportation impact study, <clears throat> we um, recommended pursuit of that um, connection. So, you know, we will uh, work with the township PennDOT uh, to meet with the Turnpike and pursue that connection with them. And what was the site previously approved for? Uh, the site was previously approved for a 2 million square foot corporate campus with approximately 8,000 employees. And that's what we refer to as the Vanguard, um, the Vanguard site? Yes. And can you describe what um, TPD studied as to develop as to the development of the site? Certainly. Uh, our, our traffic impact study, transportation impact study, studied a uh, distribution warehouse at approximately uh, one point nine nine seven uh, well, million square feet. Um, the plan in front of you is approximately one point nine two nine million square feet. Uh, so our transportation impact study had a, a slightly higher uh, size that was evaluated, which leads to a, a bit more conservative analysis. And again, you had briefly described the access and egress to the site. Can um, you describe the um, Route 100? Yes. It, I guess the, what we would want to describe is how we would access the site from the north and the south on 100. So from the north on 100, traveling southbound, you would uh, travel through the Sherry Boulevard intersection, enter the jug handle, uh, go around the jug handle, come out to the west side of Sherry Boulevard, come across and enter the site uh, that way. Um, exiting the site to the north, you would come out of uh, typically the main driveway, come out, make a right out of there, come down to the intersection of route with Route 100 and travel to the north. Um, the south is a bit more direct. It's uh, if you're traveling from the south, you would travel northbound on Route 100, make a right turn on Sherry Boulevard, a left into the site, and coming back out, you would come out onto Sherry Boulevard and make a left onto Route 100. And that is without consideration of the turnpike, call it slip ramp. Um, if the turnpike ramp is, in, is allowed to be made, the connection, um, the ingress directly to those ramps would allow you to get on both directions of, of the turnpike exiting the site. And um, would you, so you would not, if you're coming down Route 100, and I apologize, I have my, don't recall the direction, coming from the left, would you be able to make a left into the site or would you use the jug handle? No, there would be no direct left turn from Route 100 to Sherry Boulevard. There would be a direct left turn from Sherry Boulevard into the site for sure. Okay. 
And what's the, um, how will trucks and cars, uh, where do you expect them to go? Do you expect them to come to Route 100 or else, elsewhere when they exit the site? Well, the, the majority of traffic would be destined for, destined for Route 100, especially trucks. Uh, our initial evaluations indicate that uh, at least 80% would, would travel to and from the turnpike due to the nature of the uh, use, certainly. Um, the uh, employees and those who work here would tend to follow more um, typical traffic patterns that you would see in the area. Um, that commuters have, and if I just pull this up real quick, I can look at the percentages that we had assumed in our study. Um, so for instance, if you were uh, looking to the north or the south on Route 100, you would probably be in the range of about 15%, 15 to 20% of our traffic. Um, and those using the turnpike um, would be about 30%. Uh, that's of the employees versus the 80% that you will see for trucks. And then you would have some um, minimal use of, of Route 100, certainly going to, to the north and to the south and Route 113 to the east towards Phoenixville and, and down to the south towards Route 30. Uh, you would see some, some trucks utilizing them, but the majority would be utilizing the turnpike. And again, if the turnpike does not approve, approve the connection that you were testifying in reference to, would the proposed traffic improvements be able to handle the traffic generated by the development? Yes, as I stated, we, we prepared our study under the assumption that that connection is not able to be made uh, so that we were assured that if it cannot be made, we, we have the improvements in place uh, necessary to, to handle the traffic. And can you explain what the traffic study evaluated? Certainly. Um, the, Traffic study evaluated the intersections uh, on Route 100 from Eagle View Boulevard down to Route 113. Uh, we evaluated, uh, certainly in, including Sherry Boulevard, uh, we evaluated the Sherry Boulevard intersection um, with Route 113 and the access points along Sherry Boulevard. Uh, in order to do so, we compiled traffic data that was available to us from different sources uh, through PennDOT um, and through previous studies that were completed. Uh, the reason we did that was, you know, we're certainly know that we're all in a pandemic. Traffic levels when we we're completing our study are, were not up to pre-COVID levels as we're referring to them. Um, so we evaluated uh, available data, traffic counts at um, those intersections and we increase those by PennDOT growth percentages to determine a, a future no build uh, traffic volume condition along Route 100, 113 and, and Sherry Boulevard. Uh, the future no build in essence is the, the traffic that you would anticipate, the traffic conditions you would anticipate at those intersections should nothing occur uh, on the site. Um, we then utilize published data and that's put out by the Institute of Transportation Engineers uh, regarding traffic generation, trip generation for certain land uses. Um, they have uh, done completed studies at actually actual operating facilities uh, similar to the proposed use as well as others, you know, certain uh, retail residential type uses, but those data are uh, included in, in their manual, which uh, allow you to determine traffic generated by a certain use. Um, and I should note that when you're doing these evaluations, as is stated in your code, uh, you typically look at a, the rush hour, uh, but in the, uh, what we call it is the peak hour, and that typically occurs between seven and nine in the morning, four to six in the evening. And that's you know, typically associated with the com commuter peak. Um, so you determine the commuter peak traffic volumes from your site, add those to those future build conditions to determine a future uh, traffic volume that would be associated uh, after uh, completion of, of the site. Um, at that point, we can evaluate the operations at the uh, traffic study intersections uh, to determine what type of uh, the intersections are measured in, in the amount of delay that people uh, see when going through an intersection. Uh, so the 
you calculate what the uh, average delay that a motorist uh, sees going through an intersection during those peak hours. Um, and that's done through an evaluation of, of the green time that's available, the number of lanes, uh, the configuration. And uh, once you determine that for your future no build conditions, you compare that with your future build conditions and identify improvements uh, that are needed to bring your build condition uh, scenario back to a level um, equal to your, your no build condition. So that's essentially called mitigating the impact from your development. Um, I should note that the data that uh, in ITE notes that the site as proposed during a, a peak hour um, in the morning would, would generate 340 trips. And of those trips, 40 would be trucks. Uh, in the afternoon or evening peak hour or rush hour as it's referred to, you would have 380 trips, um, 60 of which would be truck trips. Uh, to put that in perspective, the previously approved use um, had peak hour trip totals in excess of 5,000 trips. Um, so when comparing the site to the previously approved site, it's interesting that, in fact, the amount of traffic that is generated by our site over the course of a whole day in 24 hours, which is about 3,500 trips, um, is less than the previously approved site, what it generated in an hour's time. So we have 3,500 trips that we're generating over the course of a 24-hour period. The previously approved site had over 5,000 in just an hour's time. Um, but in the evaluation, what's done is, is to evaluate those peak hours. So to reiterate those numbers, 340 trips in the morning from our 380 trips uh, in the evening. And um, Eric, can you just explain what a trip is? Oh, yeah, a trip is a, a vehicle entering the site or exiting the site. So those, those trip totals that I gave you are both the entering and the exiting uh, trips um, total. And um, how many uh, truck trips during the peak hour would you anticipate to travel past um, the JW Pepper building? Well, as I had indicated, um, you know, a lot of most of our truck traffic is destined to and from the turnpike. Um, we anticipate probably about 5% going to uh, 113 call it to the east towards Phoenixville coming to and from there. So it would be about three truck trips would travel past um, that facility uh, in an hour's time. And uh, based on your experience, can you generally compare the traffic uh, as to the proposed use to other permitted uses in the PIC district? Yeah, generally speaking, the, this type of use, this warehouse distribution use, has a, a lesser trip generation total per square foot than a um, office complex or a, a retail establishment. Um, you know, retail establishment has a has a higher trip generation rate per square foot than office. Office has a higher one than than the proposed use. And um, can you explain what uh, you determined from doing the traffic impact study as to um, improvements? Certainly, uh, you know, as expected and based on our distribution with most of the, you know, certainly the truck traffic and a lot of the vehicle traffic uh, destined to and from 100 and the turnpike, you know, our, the focus of the improvements was certainly at the Sherry Boulevard intersection with Route 100. Uh, I don't know if we have the ability to zoom in a little bit on that on uh, exhibit A2, but if we don't, that's fine. Uh, so we identified uh, a number of improvements to be completed at that intersection uh, to help operations and mitigate the impact. Uh, the first one, uh, I'll call it the uh, relocation of the jug handle. And the relocation of the jug handle is a little bit misleading. And what I talk about there is essentially the uh, where the jug handle intersects Sherry Boulevard, uh, we're looking to pull that uh, further away from Route 100. And what that allows us to do is 
is twofold. One is to provide some addition, an additional lane on Sherry Boulevard coming across Route 100, but also to provide additional vehicle stacking. You know, when you're waiting at the light there, more vehicles will be able to queue before they encounter the, the jug handle and uh, block traffic from coming out of there. So um, that was the first thing that we identified. The traveling plan from the plan bottom to the plan top from there. Uh, we're looking at a reconfiguration of Sherry Boulevard to provide a, an additional lane uh, there. So when uh, it is completed, you will have uh, two lanes that are able to turn left and two lanes that are able to go straight across Route 100. Um, that will uh, necessitate uh, the need for some widening on the south side of Sherry Boulevard. Um, plan right <laughs> towards that way. Uh, so the alignment works. And when we do that, we then have the ability to provide an, an additional left turn lane coming out of Sherry Boulevard, traveling westbound to turn left to go southbound on Route 100. Uh, the other thing, you know, as I noted previously, we did not consider the direct access to the turnpike, uh, knowing that we were dealing with uh, trucks that would need to go to the north on Route 100. Um, we are proposing uh, a channelized right uh, on Sherry Boulevard at Route 100. And it sort of, sort of catches up there. Um, so there will be a channelized right turn movement provided on westbound Sherry Boulevard to travel northbound on Route 100. And where the park is located, you'll note that there is widening noted in that location. And what that will do is provide an, a lane so the people coming out of Sherry Boulevard have their own dedicated lane to travel north on 100. Um, that would merge uh, at some point, we're showing it near the existing driveway, merge into the northbound 100 traffic. Uh, what that does, it allows vehicles coming out of Sherry Boulevard to complete that movement in a free flow nature. They won't necessarily need to um, stop if they have the, the, the green indication and it'll allow uh, trucks that are uh, exiting the site going to the north on 100 or the turnpike to get up to speed before they have to merge into the northbound Route 100 traffic. And then Eric, um, can you discuss the pedestrian crossing on Route 100? Certainly, and it, it may not be evident here, but our, our goal is to keep that pedestrian crossing. And the crossing we're speaking about is crossing the northern leg of Route 100. Uh, there exists a, a pedestrian crossing um, in that area today. Our goal would be to uh, cross them in the same distance that they have today and provide a refuge in that pork chop island that we'll be providing. And um, the, the discussion um, or the, the thought being that we could then control the right turn lane via signal control and give them the opportunity to cross from the pork chop to the corner where the park is located. So again, the crossing of Route 100, the distance would remain the same as it is today. There'd be a refuge provided in the pork chop island and then the ability to cross under signal control uh, across the right turn lane. And Eric, will you be looking at Sherry Boulevard from a structural perspective? Yes, um, there have been discussions about Sherry Boulevard and the ability to handle the uh, traffic associated with the development, specifically the truck traffic. So we have um, engaged, well, we may not have engaged already, but we've discussed um, engaging a uh, a firm to evaluate the, uh, the uh, structural configuration of Sherry Boulevard. And essentially what you do is you take core samples throughout the roadway to determine if the roadbed is structurally adequate to handle uh, additional truck traffic as proposed. Um, additionally, we'll be looking at the what I'll call the lateral configuration of, of Sherry Boulevard. Um, as it exists today, there's two lanes in each direction with a center raised landscape median. 
Um, if you travel Sherry Boulevard, and this is due to a, a number of things, but you know they, their, their lane widths are 11 feet wide. Um, there's vegetation on uh, pretty close to the roadway on both, both in the median and along the roadway, uh, which kind of gives it a, a little bit of a constricted feel. You don't have what we, we call a clear zone next to the roadway that gives you, you know, the thought that you have an unencumbered path. So we'll be looking at, at Sherry Boulevard from that perspective um, to determine, you know, what the configuration should look like. Uh, if we can soften up some of the curves, provide shoulder, um, you know, do we really need the, all that raised uh, landscape median? Do we need the two lanes in each direction? You know, all of these we'll, we'll be uh, tackling during land development with input from, from the township. And uh, what's the uh, width of the cartway? Currently, uh, the cartway width uh, between the curb lines is approximately uh, 58 feet. So typical, typical lane, uh, roadway lane ranges from 10 feet to 12 or 14 feet. Um, so we have, the, we have a lot of room to work with in there to, to soften that up and, and to uh, provide some shoulder areas and such in locations. And Eric, does the um, Township have an Act 209 traffic impact fee ordinance, and can you explain what that means? <laughs> they do. Uh, traffic, uh, Township has an Act 209 um, traffic impact fee ordinance. Act 209 of 1990 uh, through the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania allowed municipalities to collect impact fees um, it, with, with uh, land development applications uh, if they prepared the proper studies uh, and the studies, what they do is they evaluate uh, the capacity uh, in the township, capacity of intersections and roadways in the township. Uh, they evaluate uh, land uses that um, are zone, zoning in the township uh, to determine what kind of land uses may come online on undeveloped land. They identify improvements uh, to be implemented Again, this is a pretty shortened version of what it is, but identify improvements, uh, put a cost to those improvements, and then equate that cost to the amount of traffic that is generated by development um, yet to be seen in the township. And from there, you can you determine a fee, and then that fee is applied to each land development application based on the amount of afternoon peak hour traffic that that development generates. And Eric, have you reviewed um, the Township the Traffic Engineer McMahon's July 31st, 2020 review letter? Yes. And have you spoken to Dean Kaiser from McMahon? I have. I have spoken with him regarding uh, that review letter. And can the comments raised in the letter be addressed during land development? Yes. Yeah, so as we proceed through land development, assuming we're successful in our conditional use application, uh, we'll be uh, updating our traffic impact study. Uh, not only do we have the review from Mr. Kaiser and McMahon Associates, but we've also uh, engaged PennDOT with a review uh, of our traffic scope. Uh, so we'll be implementing uh, any and all comments from that as, as well. And can you just briefly explain, if you haven't already, why would PennDOT be involved? Well, <clears throat> PennDOT is involved because we anticipate the need to uh, construct improvements within uh, Commonwealth maintained right of way, Route 100 in this case. Uh, so whenever you do uh, any type of work within PennDOT's right of way, you know, you're required to get a highway occupancy permit for that to complete that work. Um, so anticipating we would have to do those improvements, we engage PennDOT um, and the first step of engagement is to prepare a uh, scope application to them uh, with our anticipated uh, intersections, the traffic generation assumptions that we'll be using, the, uh, you know, everything I went through before, the existing volume and uh, future volume uh, development. And we did hear back from them. Uh, they are uh, generally consistent with our, uh, our scope. Uh, they certainly uh, support us and would participate in any conversations with the Turnpike. Um, and they also agreed with the trip generation data that I 
supplied during my testimony tonight is the same I supplied to them. And have you reviewed um, the Township Engineer Review Letter of July 23rd, 2020? Yes. And under general comments, the Township Engineer sets forth certain uh, comments related to traffic and can those be addressed during land development? Yes, certainly. And have you reviewed the Bogia letter, engineering letter of October 8th, 2020 and the subsequent township response dated October 20th, 2020? Yes. And can you just comment on those? Yeah, in review of those two uh, documents, there are no comments uh, specifically addressed in the McMahon response that we cannot uh, further address during land development. And can you address the issue of direct access to Route 100? Yeah, direct access to Route 100 <clears throat> uh, has been a, a um, an idea that we have certainly evaluated as part of our development team in the past. Um, you know, Route 100 is a principal arterial with a speed of 55 miles per hour. Uh, there's limited access right of way. Limited access um, means that you can't readily get direct access to it, therefore limited access. Um, and we didn't think it, it was an appropriate location uh, for direct access to Route 100, given the roadway characteristics. Um, certainly uh, McMahon was of the same opinion in their response of October 20th, uh, they stated as much. And um, just to be clear, you can turn left onto Route uh, 100 from Sherry Boulevard. Correct, right. I, Put it this way, we, we can we consider direct access to Route 100, but as I stated, similar to the connection to the Turnpike, of which we will certainly pursue, we wanted to present uh, improvements that we felt we could make uh, to mitigate our impact um, at, at conditional reuse. I, I didn't want to come and prepare a study that had direct access to Route 100 or connection to the Turnpike in our transportation impact study identify lesser improvements at Sherry Boulevard and Route 100, and then we get our conditional use moved down the line and we're not able to make those connections for whatever reason. Uh, you know, I certainly wasn't comfortable in that approach. So, you know, approaching this to assume that we do not get a turnpike connection, we don't have direct access to Route 100, identifying what we can do at Sherry and, and 100, and, you know, we can agree to those improvements, you know, during a conditional use. It's not to say that we're not going to endeavor to uh, get the turnpike connection or if there are other opportunities through our coordination with PennDOT or the township or, or otherwise um, that we wouldn't pursue any other opportunity. And addressing uh, some of the comments in the McMahon letter, um, it indicates the traffic study should provide traffic volume figures for the entire study area for existing base and proposed projected peak hour conditions. Can you explain that and how you will address that? Yeah, what we provided in our study, our initial conditional use study, were tables of traffic volumes uh, depicting, you know, existing traffic volumes, future traffic volumes. Um, as is the, typically the case when we um, change and, and modify the, the traffic impact study and certainly during land development and with PennDOT, we would provide schematic figures depicting those volumes uh, makes it a little easier to uh, review, certainly um, see what, what kind of traffic we're looking at. So we'll certainly provide those. But it doesn't change the uh, impetus of your study? No. And do, does the time periods of, of shifts that are expected to occur or the number of employees change your opinion as to the AM and PM peak? No, for this type of use, it doesn't. You know, the, you have different shift work. And like I said, the, the traffic volume and the trip generation associated with this use um, has been studied at actual locations. Um, the, what, I would, what would change my study is if it was a different type of use, such as an office, whereas you had everyone coming in between 8.30 and 9 o'clock in the morning or leaving between, you know, 5 and 6 in the afternoon. Um, you know, these types of, of facilities have certainly have different shifts associated with them. Uh, a lot of them start pre-dawn hours. Um, some of them, you know, trickle into those, those rush hours, which is why you see, you know, some traffic generated during those peak hours. Um, 
but uh, to answer your question, you know, we can provide any information that we have as, as users are identified, but it wouldn't change um, significantly how, how the uh, traffic study is, is prepared. And in your opinion, is the projected truck traffic appropriate on Cherry Boulevard? Yes, with the caveat that we'll certainly be evaluating the, the structural integrity and the, the lateral um, you know, operations. You know, it, it, it is in the PIC zoning district. It has a, a speed limit of 35 miles per hour. Um, this is what was envisioned, uh, I believe, when, when Sherry Boulevard was developed. So I, um, you know, I think it's appropriate. And um, have you reviewed a concept drawing for the turnpike access prepared by BEI? And I know, um, I believe it was received today. Were you able yes, to review that? Preliminarily, I, I was able to review it. And can you just briefly describe it and uh, your response to that? Well, certainly I don't want to uh, take any thunder away from Mr. Boja from her, for his testimony, but um, essentially it, it, it uh, depicted a, an intersection uh, to Route 100 with direct access from both the uh, uh, off-ramp for the turnpike, yes, in that general area, I'll, I'll call it near the, uh, the slip ramp that we would uh, pursue. Um, it would, it would depict it a, not only a uh, limited access right-of-way break on, on one side, but a full median break to create a full intersection, and there was a uh, traffic signal uh, depicted uh, on that plan. Um, you know, just in reviewing that, uh, some items that I thought were of interest with that that would introduce stops uh, on you know, vehicle stops at the, at the signal on both Route 100 and the Turnpike ramp where they don't uh, exist. Uh, it would also introduce some additional vehicle conflict points due to a full new intersection uh, that don't exist today in an area where you know, it's a principal arterial roadway, uh, has limited access right of way. Um, you know, I assume there's some reason that there's limited access right of way in that area. Um, you know, I think it would probably require some sort of uh, point of access study, uh, which is a pretty uh, intricate endeavor uh, that you would have to uh, evaluate. Um, you know, I think the difference between that type of, of intersection treatment and what we're proposing is that, um, not proposing, but we plan to pursue with our direct connection for ingress, uh, egress movements is it doesn't fundamentally change the operation of, of the interchange as it exists today and as it's designed today um, with the uh, large areas for um, acceleration, uh, deceleration and the like. And uh, Eric, you had indicated uh, your coordination with um, PennDOT. Can you describe your coordination with the Turnpike also? Certainly. <clears throat> after we, excuse me, uh, after, you know, earlier uh, we had received comments from the township regarding the impact study. And in those comments, they um, supported our pursuit of that connection. Uh, we submitted the scope application to PennDOT and they in turn uh, so said that they would participate in any kind of meetings that we had uh, with the Turnpike. So once we received that information from PennDOT, we have submitted a request to the Turnpike Commission uh, to uh, have a meeting to kick off discussions of this connection. Um, so that has been sent to the Turnpike. We have yet to receive a response on that. And Eric, during land development, you will be evaluating Cherry Boulevard for configuration, lane widths, and operations, well, as well as its structural integrity, and updating the traffic study, correct? Yes. And in your professional opinion, will there be an adverse impact on the level of service of the public roads and road in intersections providing access to and in the area of the subject property if the requested conditional uses are approved? Uh, no, not with the improvements that will be completed by the applicant. And again, those improvements will be further delineated during the land development process? Yes, that's correct. And in your professional opinion, will the conditional use approval have the effect of materially increasing traffic congestion on the roads or at the road intersections? No, as I had indicated earlier, the, 
you know, this type of use has traffic uh, spread out uh, over the entire day uh, pr pretty well evenly uh, versus, like I said, your uh, corporate campuses, which have large influxes of traffic at, at, you know, during those rush hours when everybody else is trying to get to work. Um, so I, I'd say that, um, no. And in your professional opinion, will the requested conditional uses adversely affect the public health, safety, or welfare as it pertains to traffic? No, based on my testimony this evening, I'd say no. And Mr. Free, that's all the questions I have, uh, Mr. Austin Chuck, at this time. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Buck, do you have any cross? Uh, no, we do not have any questions for Mr. Austin Chuck. Okay. How about the Mr. Chairman? Does the board have any questions? Hi, Kim here. I had a question. Um, if you were to do the traffic study when school is back in session, would you expect the same results or different? And if so, how would it be different? I, I would not anticipate significantly different results. Um, as I indicated, we, we utilized um, data that was available. The data, the most recent data we had, I believe was from 2017, so it wasn't too old. Um, now we did have uh, older data than that, which we increased in um, high percentage. Uh, but when you do these evaluations, as I had indicated, what you're doing is a comparison of a future no build condition versus a future build condition. So you can start with a, a lesser, let's call it future build condition, but your impact that you're going to see is still going to be evaluated in the same manner. Uh, I should also note that uh, as part of Mr. Kaiser's um, letter, uh, he indicated that you know once we are open and operating, we'd like to do some updated traffic counts if appropriate, you know, given where we're going to stand at that time, but certainly to see if there, there are, and this will be a condition of the PennDOT permit as well, um, to update, you know, and make sure that the traffic signal operations are appropriate given the, the type of traffic that we're seeing. But short answer would be no, I would anticipate, would not anticipate any significant changes um, due to that. What is your definition of significant? What is my definition of significant in that regard? I would say I would I would say that I would not anticipate any additional lanes be identified. I would say perhaps there may be a tweak to a, um, a signal operation uh, in terms of length of time that a certain movement would would get. Um, but again, that would be encompassed in in those future uh, evaluations for signal timing operations. Okay, thank you. Any other board comment or question? Um, Mamie Bauman here. I have a question. Um, I was just going to ask if noise pollution, I know residents are concerned about both noise pollution of this project and potential air pollution from the trucks, if that was at all considered in your traffic study. The, the noise pollution and what was the other one? The um, Emissions or emissions. air? No, they, yeah. those are not um, part of transportation impact studies as they're defined. The transportation impact studies that are required by PennDOT and by municipalities focus on uh, capacity of roadways uh, more so than anything else. Uh, they're not typically considered as part of, of this type of study. So I, I first I have uh, this is Bill Miller. Mimi, are you are you done? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Uh, the I had a, one point for clarification. I had a little audio problem a little earlier. You had you were uh, stating the percentage of of traffic that you were going to uh, predict was going into the turnpike from the the site, and I had missed that. Um, could you could you just for my for my uh, uh, knowledge? In, in terms of truck traffic, the uh, assumption we had in our traffic study was was. 80% of the traffic would be to and from the turnpike. Um, with regard to vehicle traffic for the turnpike, it is 30% uh, of the passenger vehicles or you know, typically employees, I would say, would be destined. 
Um, my, my concern, um, one of, <coughs> excuse me, one of my concerns uh, is at the the intersection of Sherry and and 100. Um, that that particular stretch of road actually has a, a bit of an incline. Um, I'm sure you're aware, uh, which uh, is a little deceptive unless you're really looking. It, it is it is actually I think a little bit of a dangerous spot for especially for trucks in, in inclement weather. Um, is there any improvements that are planned that might uh, mitigate the, the danger of that, that specific area? We, we've not identified anything specific, but it's certainly that something we can evaluate through our coordination with PennDOT and with McMahon Associates to see if there are some treatments that we can provide in terms of uh, pavement treatments um, for that, or if there's the ability to lessen that, um, that incline, we'll certainly evaluate that in, in in uh, those conversations. Uh, another area that was, in, it's the same intersection, but the um, the, the roundabout or, or whatever, however you want to call it, um, I'm seeing it's being expanded, but I would also expect there to be an, ad, an, an additional number of cars taking that. Is, is that going to be enough that if there's a backup that there's not a uh, creating a traffic jam or are we, um, expecting that to be able to handle the amount of the additional amount of traffic into that, that dog legger. Right. So the, well, there's two, two components to that side of Sherry Boulevard. One is the pulling of the, the intersection away from Route 100. Right. Um, and then the expansion of Sherry Boulevard to provide additional capacity. So uh, we found with those two improvements in concert, you have the ability to handle the vehicle queue at Route 100 backing so westward, I guess, along Sherry Boulevard, so it doesn't block that jug handle. Um, so we anticipate that those vehicles would clear out every cycle and there wouldn't be a backup onto the, uh, through the jug handle. Um, and you had mentioned that during the peak hours for the, the afternoon peak hours, I think you said there'd be about 60 trips, um, additional trips, was that the right number or did I, did I get that right? That was the, the number I'd stated was it was total trips in, in an hour's time in the afternoon was 380 trips. Of okay. those 380 trips, 60 were anticipated to be trucks. Okay, that's, that's what, and, and if the uh, slip ramp to the turnpike, the direct access to the turnpike, you would predict that the approximately between 45 and 50 of those would be directly to the, to the turnpike? Well, that the, the 60 truck trips are both entering and exiting. So okay. Make like, you know, make it simple. Let's say it's 30 exiting trips. So put my math on the spot here, but you know, the between 40 and 30 would, would utilize the turnpike. So okay. In that regard. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. That's, that's all my questions right now. Mark, I have a couple questions for Eric. Okay. Okay. This is uh, Ted Jacomas, the township engineer. Hi, Ted. Uh, Eric, big question is what happens if you can't enlarge the jug handle? And the reason why I say that is the, the uh, westernmost part of that jug handle is right on the edge of wetlands. Mm -hmm. And the southern side of the jug handle is practically you know, next to the house. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like you would probably have to get the, the last house on Village Ave. And uh, the widening you're proposing on Sherry Boulevard. Sherry Boulevard was literally built through wetlands for which uh, a lot of mitigation. If you look at this plan, there's ponds over by the ramp mm -hmm. uh, coming off the turnpike. Those are the mitigation areas for the wetlands that were uh, disturbed when the uh, uh, jug handle was originally uh, built. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can't do it, what do you do? Well, it, have you been in our, our our team meetings, Ted? Because, you know, when we first started talking about this jug handle, that's certainly one of the considerations um, were the wetlands. To clarify things, and I think it's a bit misleading on the aerial because it didn't quite line up correctly, our intention is not to widen anything to the south toward that existing house as it as it exists i think it 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 probably is just is a bit misleading uh, in how it lines up so uh what we uh plan to do is is utilize the existing 
jug handle in that area. And as you travel towards the west in that area there is where the alignment would go. And you're absolutely right. Um, there are wetlands there. Um, we do anticipate uh, permitting required. Uh, environmental permitting is part of that. Uh, I'm not the person to answer the, the specifics of the question of that, but it's my understanding that we um, have the ability to do some mitigation measures um, on site and that type of thing. Again, um, that's not my, my cup of tea, but um, we will be um, evaluating that. To answer your question uh, specifically with regard to if we can't get it, I, you know, obviously we would have to look at some additional measures, uh, certainly at the intersection. Uh, I don't know specifically what they may be, but adding capacity in some fashion such that we could provide the amount of green time needed to clear out that queue um, uh, as it approaches the jug handle. Uh, that would be the, the simple answer to the question. I don't have a specific answer to what has been identified, if anything, uh, but we know that they, we do have to uh, pursue permitting, uh, environmental permitting for, for that uh, jug handle change. I have one other question for you, Eric. Uh, the township over time has always anticipated that uh, a vehicle heading north on 100 into the intersection of Sherry Boulevard mm -hmm. would have one way or the other to be able to make uh, a left or a west and uh, turn on the Sherry Boulevard by virtue of either another jug handle over in the quadrant where the park is proposed or the other uh, possibility was it's actually on the township's official map. The township shows a, a road coming off of what, what is called, I think it's called Marsh Creek Road that, that, that has the uh, north uh, east quadrant of Route 100. It actually had a road going over to Sherry Boulevard for uh, vehicles to be able to come uh, north on 100, take that long route, but they'd, they'd be able to get on Sherry Boulevard and head over. Does your study look at any of that? No, we did. We the with regard to uh, back it up towards the uh, first thing you noted, which was the, the jug handle. I'll call it in the northeast quadrant, and it did come up with uh, in my conversations with with Mr. Kaiser uh, with regard to a, a jug handle in that area. Uh, the study did not consider that, um, you know, it's been the uh, direction uh, that the applicant um, has received that, you know, the, the park was, was more of the uh, route they wanted to go in, in that location. Um, you know, certainly providing a jug handle there would, would um, eliminate a good portion of, of that park. Um, I will say with regard, it's, I believe you're right, it's Marsh Creek Drive. Um, that was not evaluated. However, um, you know, the applicant does control that parcel um, on the corner there. So there may be an opportunity um, mm -hmm. during the land development for that application that something could be evaluated as part of that. Okay. The, the last thing I just want to let you know, from the township's view, the direct access to the turnpike for you know getting on the turnpike is very important it was important during the vanguard project we we know a lot of the turnpike people and we will strongly push for that and want to be part of that push that that's great to hear because i, I will tell you when i first met with john nielsen on this project as with mo all of his projects that i work on for him he says he wants to provide the best user you know, experience that he can. He's been, every time I get on the phone with him, he is <laughs> saying, we got to get, we got to get that connection. Um, so yeah, we, I appreciate that. And um, we certainly will include the township in any discussions there. And it is certainly our, um, our goal to get that connection. I just, like I stated in my testimony, I just wanted to, pre to present something that we knew we could do, uh, but still uh, pursuing that turnpike connection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kearney, do you have any redirect? No, no redirect. All right, then. Um, Mark, I had another question. Okay. 
Kim here. Um, obviously, traffic is a concern of ours. Is there a location north or south of 100 that you've spotted where trucks can wait or sit if traffic gets backed up on 100? Because they can't circulate around in the air. I mean, they can't circle in the air. Uh, to, to the answer to the direct question, I would say no, nothing like that had been identified. My anticipation would be that they would, as any driver, would wait through whatever traffic traffic uh, condition uh, had occurred, whatever incident may be there. I don't know that anything's been identified. Um, there are shoulder areas in the neighborhood of the turnpike ramp, um, but you know, nothing's been identified to answer the direct question. Thank you. Uh, okay, Mr. Austin Chuck, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think we will take a five minute break. Is that, um, Lorraine, is that enough time for you? Yeah, yeah okay. thank you. Sure. All right, let's take five minutes and we'll resume it at, uh, let's say, uh, 840. Uh, ready to go? Lorraine, are you back? Yes, I am. All right, super. And council ready? We're ready. Yes. And I believe we're going out of order now. And Mr. Buck, you're going to call your witness? Yes, thank you, Mr. Freed. Uh, we'd like to call uh, Greg Boja, if Mr. Boja could be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Unmute yourself. I do. Thank you. Um, Mr. Boja, please uh, state your name and please spell your last name for the court reporter as well. Greg Boja. Greg Boja. Last name spelled B O G I A. And Mr. Boja, by whom are you? Boja Engineering Incorporated. And how long have you worked with Boja Engineering? Uh, since 2006. And what is your position there? President. And you are the primary uh, owner of the company? Yes. Yeah. And could you please uh, briefly uh, describe for the board your experience uh, at Boja Engineering and prior? Sure. Uh, when I, once I graduated from the University of Delaware in 1989 in the Bachelor of Civil Engineering, I worked for a company called Greiner and continued there. We did lots of transportation and traffic work for interchanges as a consultant to PennDOT as well as numerous roadways. Then I continued on uh, working as a consultant for other companies such as Traffic Planning and Design, uh, HNTB, uh, and uh, Stackhouse uh, Bensinger prior to starting my firm and have worked on projects uh, for PennDOT such as Route 202, uh, Section 400 there in King of Prussia, uh, the Woodhaven Road Interchange. Uh, I've performed the work for the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission for a uh, safety study for the entire system, uh, as well as the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, and also performing uh, innovative traffic designs for interchanges. He turned it. I, I missed. Can you hear me now? You, you turned your microphone off. All I heard was after traffic design for interchanges. Sure. So we've done that for interchanges, 
is where we're working on the Virgin Diamond interchange. Uh, we've also have performed private uh, roundabouts uh, with PennDOT's approval uh, locally and at the central office level. And Mr. Bozier, do you also carry the PTOE designation? Yes, I'm a professional traffic operations engineer. And have you testified before uh, hundreds of governmental bodies and courts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? Yes, many times. And you every time requested you qualify as an expert for those bodies and courts? Yes. I would request that the uh, board accept Mr. Boja as an expert in the field of transportation design and planning. I would be okay with accepting it. Mark, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Ms. Kearney, do you have any questions uh, or voir dire or objection? No objection. Okay. Then we will accept uh, Mr. Boja as a um, expert in transportation design and planning. Thank you. And Mr. Bocher, have you been engaged by JW Denver in connection with the Audubon development plans that are before the board tonight? Yes. Have you reviewed the traffic planning and design transportation impact study for this site dated June 29, 2020? Yes. And what are your thoughts generally uh, on that study? Uh, generally, it was a, a well put together study for a conditional use application uh, during this COVID time period. And obviously, as they go through with a full traffic impact study of uh, PennDOT nature, then that will follow the additional counts and items necessary for to meet the PennDOT strike off letters uh, relating to COVID and how counts are to be performed. And did you prepare a response letter dated October 8, uh, 2020, a copy of which has been provided to the township and to the applicant? Yes, sir. And have you reviewed uh, the memorandum from McMahon Associates dated October 2020 that we prepared in response to your October 8 letter? I did. And did you prepare a, uh, a brief conceptual plan uh, showing an intersection on Route 100 and direct access into the site that was also submitted to the township and to the applicant that I I did. And the, the reason we prepared the exhibit was we were trying to figure out a reasonable uh, improvement that would work well for the, the township, the traveling public, as well as the Audubon uh, landowner for the, the proposed development. And as we looked at that, we recognized that the, the interchange, the radiuses could be softened in order to create the signalized intersection and actually provide direct access, which would uh, we believe would be beneficial to Audubon as well as the, the rest of the public because we understood that the uh, uh, half circle that's located at Sherry Boulevard uh, could become difficult with the number of trucks depending upon arrival rates and the actual end users that something like this uh, could be evaluated. While we certainly understand that we're not asking for this to be a condition of a hearing because there, there's, it's not something that would really be acceptable for a landowner. We would really just like to see this as an evaluation that it would be evaluated when the applicant works with PennDOT uh, and the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission, that they evaluate this as a potential access uh, for this location. Uh, below I've listed a lot of the observations with this, uh, if you could scroll down a little bit, we can cover that. Uh, th this area in general has really been more rural in the past nature as developments continue to occur along the 100 corridor. It's really changed from more rural to suburban. And with that, this is really one of the only stretches where uh, Route 100 is posted at 55 miles an hour. On both sides at this location, uh, it's posted 45 miles an hour. So it would be more consistent 
to evaluate a 45 mile an hour proposed thing in the future, which would further enable uh, a traffic signal at this location, uh, which is also consistently spaced with the traffic signals that are located along Route 100 in the township. Um, and we believe that this would be a far less uh, cost design as opposed to a, a flyover type design that was looked at in the Vanguard work and still provide uh, excellent access to the site uh, would really reduce the, the level of trips and everything else associated with Sherry Boulevard and a lot of that rebuild work that we saw today. So again, we're really asking for this to be evaluated as it goes forward in land development uh, that would assist really the applicant and the township to really make a, an excellent design here at this location. And the plan that you've gone there, that it would get rid of the southbound uh, exit ramp from the turnpike onto Route 100 and just bring the southbound traffic directly onto 100 at that intersection, correct? That's correct. And there would, and there would no, be no left turns from that intersection because everybody doing that would have already gone north exiting onto Route 100 from the turnpike. Correct. And would this design uh, alleviate the need for virtually all of these Cherie Boulevard improvements uh, that we've been discussing tonight? It, it probably would. It, it's one of the reasons why we would really like to, to see this evaluated as uh, the project would move forward because in, in all probability, it'll be very tough for the, the applicant not to have any design mitigation needs uh, when they do their PennDOT study and they'll have to evaluate options. So we'd like to, to see this evaluated early on uh, in their process. And so a large portion of the cost that might otherwise go to Cherie Boulevard and Route 100 and the jug handle and the wetlands issues on the south or on the west side of Route 100, um, a, a lot of those uh, would either be eliminated or alleviated by this design. That's correct. And um, what reasons do you see that this might not be feasible other than, uh, uh, than the timing and dealing with the uh, PENDA? I, I see really the only other agency to really work with would be the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission uh, to really get them on board. So I, I think it's just something like this would really make sense for the, the township and the applicant would really like to have the support of the township that uh, an access to the perm turnpike would be essential for this project uh, with a design like this or. And in your experience as a traffic uh, planner and designer and a, a traffic engineer, is this design as you proposed here consistent with sound uh, traffic engineering practices? Yes. And as you stated before, the, the request here is not to, um, you know, as a as a condition to the granting of a conditional use to require this, but to further evaluate this uh, as the plans move forward. Is that correct? That's correct. And if following a full evaluation of this intersection, uh, it it does not pan out as a feasible alternative. Um, what what other um, parts of the Cherie Boulevard Route 100 intersection would require upgrading, in your opinion? Okay, if this uh, concept would not pan out, what I what I'd like to to see at this location would be a continued uh, effort for the slip ramp to the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh, evaluate the site distance along Route 100 northbound at the intersection of Cherie. Uh, they currently experience some hard time making rights out northbound uh, during the green phase of the, the northbound movement um, to move the, the access drive on Cherry as close as possible to Route 100, uh, evaluate signage uh, to really try to indicate trucks to enter at the first access, uh, no left turn outs along the access drives with Sherry. Uh, try to straighten up Sherry to the main entrance 
to the site, uh, provide a full evaluation of any type of mitigation concerns uh, relative to traffic degradations for Route 100 and Sherry. Address our technical comments in our comment letter and perform traffic counts in accordance with PennDOT strike off guidance and uh, meet the recommendations in the TPD study on page nine of their report. Okay. And so those specific requests that you just enumerated, those would be in addition to what uh, TPD and McMahon, uh, TPD proposed and McMahon has reviewed in the study and the McMahon review letters. Is that correct? Correct. I have no further questions of uh, Mr. Boja. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kearney. Uh, just a few questions. Um, I will, um, Mr. Boja, I wasn't sure this, the, the plan that's shown on the screen right now, this hasn't been provided to McMahon or the township engineer, has it? Uh, it was provided today as we had received okay. the, the comments from McMahon and I, I've had discussions with Mr. Austin Chuck and Dean Kaiser, you know, I previously understood that there was a concern uh, for how movements were being performed from the turnpike to Sherry and a, a design like what you, you see in front of you can generally make sure that their concerns were addressed as well for how movements would occur along Southbound 100. And um, just briefly, did your cost evaluation consider the completion of a point of access study? Uh, a design like this probably would need a point of access study. Uh, it would appear that it's probably within the limited access right away for the, the turnpike. So something like that may need to be done. I, I think the, our client would be happy that, you know, if something like this was pursued, that uh, by the time construction could be completed on an idea like this, that that could maybe be tied to occupancy because we recognize that that might delay the project a little bit, but uh, we would be supportive of trying to tie the occupancy of the buildings to having a, a design like this to provide that extra time to the, the Audubon group uh, to be able to facilitate a, a good design and direct access to the turnpike uh, for their facility. I think that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Does the board have any questions? Can I just say something real quick, Mark? Um, we did receive this concept plan uh, this afternoon. Uh, the township and the township traffic consultant and township engineer have not had a chance to review this yet. Um, we will do so. Any board? Thank you. Questions? No, not for me. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chacomas? Just actually a statement on it. My, my first look at it is that uh, the township along with PennDOT and the Turnpike spent $18 million to widen Route 100 and to allow free flow on and off the Turnpike uh, I would seriously be surprised if the turnpike will even entertain this. That's it. Okay. Mr. Buck, do you have any redirect? No, we do not. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boja. Um, and Mr. Buck, I know you, you only have the one witness. Is that correct? No, we have, we have one other witness, uh, Mr. Painter from J.W. Pepper uh, would like to testify briefly. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to move any exhibits at this point. If, if we could just move the one, the concept plan that we submitted today and Mr. Boja just testified to now, we'd like to move that as that's the only exhibit we have. Call that Pepper one? Perfect. Okay. Then uh, any objection, uh, Ms. Kearney? No objection. Okay, then that'll be admitted, um, the concept drawing 
uh, for turnpike access will be admitted as pepper one. Ms. Kearney, do you want to call your witness now? I, I, it's Mr. Babbitt, and I believe he is now on the call. Yes, I'm here. Yes, great. Raise your right hand, Mr. Babbitt. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. <clears throat> and Mr. Babbitt, can you spell your last name for the record? Yes, it's B-A-B-B-I-T-T. -T. And uh, by whom are you employed? Uh, David C. Babbitt and Associates, LLC. I'm self-employed. And can you briefly describe your educational background? Um, uh, my graduate degree is from the University of Chicago. Um, it's quite a long time ago at this point. Uh, I started as a planner in 1989 at the Montgomery County Planning Commission. I was there for about eight and a half years in the community planning section, in essence, serving as a consultant to municipalities on all matters of planning and zoning. In 1997, I left the County Planning Commission and formed my own practice, at first in White Marsh Township, Montgomery County, and since the year 2000 in Fraser, uh, Chester County. And your CV is marked as Exhibit Tab A16 in the Applicant's Exhibits booklet? I believe it is, yes. And could you describe for the board what AICP <laughs> and NJPP stand for? AICP is the American Institute of Certified Planners. It is the National Certification for Professional Planners. I have been a member of AICP since, I believe, 1998 or so. NJPP is a, a New Jersey professional planner, which is a, a designation requiring an examination for doing uh, any planning work in the state of New Jersey. And uh, can you give ex some examples of the representative types of projects that you've worked on in the past few years? <clears throat> Well, I've done a great many fiscal impact analyses. There's it's probably uh, about 30 or 40 percent of my practice. I've done uh, probably in the range of eight or 10 fiscal impact analyses in, in a given year. Earlier this year, I've worked on uh, apartment complexes in um, uh, Doylestown Borough in Upper Dublin Township. Uh, I did a large warehouse complex in Falls Township, Bucks County. I have worked on projects um, throughout the Philadelphia area. Uh, I also do other work, zoning work. I'm a, an expert witness in zoning hearings. I've done a number of Act 209 studies, land use assumptions reports for a variety of municipalities in um, central Pennsylvania, southeastern Pennsylvania, and the Lehigh Valley. I also served for one year or almost a year as the interim director of planning and development at Lower Providence Township, which is south central Montgomery County. Uh, and I will also say that um, since about 2005, I've taught classes in planning and zoning under the auspices of an organization called the Pennsylvania Municipal Planning Education Institute, or PMPEI. PMPEI sponsors courses uh, all over the Commonwealth. Typically, our courses are uh, that take place at the um, Westchester University Business School campus on McDermott Drive, north of the borough. I've been doing that now for about 15 years. And have you previously testified before zoning hearing boards or other municipal bodies in Pennsylvania? Yes, numerous times. And have you previously been accepted as an expert witnesses before those bodies? Yes, many, many times. And what, what type of expert witness? Well, again, for fiscal impact analysis, uh, sometimes for uh, zoning matters, uh, expert witnessing. Uh, I'm working on a case now for spot zoning, for example. Um, I've worked on uh, curative amendments and validity challenges, both uh, defending municipalities and uh, um, on behalf of applicants. Uh, I've done a, a great deal of work in a, in a variety of uh, capacities. And Mr. Fried, I'd like to offer um, Mr. Babbitt as an expert in land planning with an emphasis in uh, fiscal impact studies. Mr. Buck, do you have any voir dire or objection? No, no objection. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then uh, the board will accept uh, Mr. Babbitt as an expert in land planning with an emphasis in physical uh, fiscal impact analysis. Thank you. And Mr. Babbitt, are you familiar with the property that's the subject of the conditional use application? I am. 
and as part of the requirements of the Township Ordinance Section 806.4F, did you prepare a fiscal impact study? I did. And you reviewed that section and um, prepared your in fiscal impact study in accordance with the section of the ordinance? Well, to be perfectly technical, the ordinance requires a particular method called the case study method. Uh, I've done several case study methods, mostly of large developments, and um, uh, I did not do a case study method in this instance for a variety of reasons, the most important of which is that a case study method unfortunately requires a great deal of, uh, of investment on the time of uh, time and therefore money uh, by township officials. I would have had to interview the township manager, um, police chief, fire chief, public works director, uh, all kinds of other township officials. And um, um, my understanding, my, my experience has been that municipalities tend not to want to have their, uh, their employees and their representatives uh, spend uh, the time that's necessary on a case study method. So I did instead what's called the proportional valuation method. And can you describe that method? <clears throat> yes. Um, the, uh, uh, are you showing the um, spreadsheets on the screen, Bernadette? The fiscal impact study is exhibit tab A3. Huh. I'm not sure who has control of the... Uh... I have control of it, although it was not in the original submission, so I don't believe I have it. I actually have it if you want to give me the ability. One second. If you can. Well, while you're working on that, let me just go okay. ahead and start describing the process. Um, <clears throat> um, just so they're all on the same page, this is an analysis to the township and to the school district of the projected revenue and expenditures based on the current year of revenue expenditures and taxation. Uh, it simply is a snapshot in time uh, using uh, the current budgets and current tax structures for both the township and the school district. Um, we start with assessments. Uh, I found two very good comparable properties, recently constructed um, um, industrial warehouses in West Whiteland Township, obviously the adjacent municipality, both were built in 2015. They're in the range, they come out with a range of about $50 per square foot. So that's what I used for the assessed value. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, slightly higher than $50 per square foot. Let me get that for you right now. Oh, no, I used $50 per square foot, slightly higher than what those existing two uh, developments showed because obviously a new development would be newer. Um, so the assessed value uh, is projected at $96,444,000 at build out. That projected assessed value comes to 5.8% of the total assessed value of all township properties. According to the Chester County Assessment Office computer records as of a couple of months ago, uh, the, the township's assessed value is uh, just shy of $1.7 billion. So the 96,444,000 would represent 5.8% of the assessed value of the township properties and about 1.7% of the existing assessed value of the Downingtown Area School District properties, which is about $5.6 billion, according to the school district budget. Um, just by comparison, right now, the property's total assessed value comes to about 3.7 million. So this would be a significant development, a significant increase in the assessed value, and that is going to be the key to a lot of the revenue sources, which we'll go into in a minute. Demographics are based on national studies that appear in a book that unfortunately has the title, Who Lives in New Jersey Housing? Uh, it's called that simply because the uh, professors at Rutgers University who generated the fiscal impact analysis procedures over the last 40 almost 50 years now, uh, uh, got the state of New Jersey to subsidize uh, this book, which actually provides demographic multipliers for residential development in New Jersey. Obviously, I didn't use those, but it also includes non-residential multipliers, 
from nationwide studies. And that study recommends using a, a figure of 0 0.85 workers per thousand square feet. Multiply that times the number of square feet and we're looking at 1,640 workers. Now I will note that this figure is full-time equivalent positions, not the number of employees. The number of employees is likely to be higher because some of those positions are likely to be part-time or seasonal. Some of the positions are likely to have turnover. So within a given position during the course of a year, you might have two or even three different people. The annual salary for the workers is based on uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics figures uh, for transportation and material moving occupations and for first line supervisors of transportation and material moving workers. The uh, weighted average comes out to an average annual salary of $38,842 per worker. Uh, the other demographic that's worth noting here on the school district spreadsheet is that because this project is completely non-residential in nature, there will be zero school age children and therefore zero public school students. The township expenditures uh, are based on the township's budget. Uh, the 2020 budget has three operating funds, the general fund, the hydrant fund, and the state liquid fuels fund, which total just shy of $11.1 .1 million. The other funds are generally speaking proprietary funds, such as the sewer fund. They would be excluded because a dollar in equals a dollar out. These are, uh, the sewer fund is not supported by tax revenue. It's supported by user fees and tapping fees. Uh, the capital improvements fund is a very small fund, which is uh, just money transferred from the general fund for capital uh, infrastructure. The water fund is, is different. That's excluded. There are some developer impact funds, again, excluded because they're for very specific purposes. Foreign fire insurance fund uh, is a state pass-through fund going to the Lionville Fire Company. And then we have the police pension fund and insurance trust fund, which are fiduciary funds using some general fund money and some employee contributions to pay for future health, retirement, or other benefits. But I will note that there is a transfer from the general fund to the police pension fund of $388,401 that is included in this analysis because it comes from the general fund. And I would consider that an annual operating expenditure. There are some other funds that we exclude, in particular, pass-through funds, things like um, uh, Pennsylvania pension grant funds, which is money from the Commonwealth to uh, subsidize the pensions of municipal workers. Uh, any revenue having to do with recycling and trash is excluded because these functions are gonna be handled privately at this development and the township will not be spending a single dollar to provide trash or recycling services to this development. Some other development related funds are also uh, excluded because they're very similarly uh, are passed through funds, the most obvious of which is building permits, 525,000. Uh, building permit is a, a, a fee for a specific activity of the township. The township can't make money off of that. And it also, I, I imagine the township's not losing any money off of its building permits. It charges exactly what it costs to provide the administration of these permits and the inspections and so forth. And there are other excluded, ex excluded expenditures. Parks, maintenance, and programs of 541,000 is excluded. Uh, again, this development is entirely non-residential and will not require any such township services. So we then get down to the net operating expenditures of about $7.6 million. The next step is to isolate the township expenditures attributable to existing non-residential development which is done using the proportional valuation method from the New Practitioner's Guide for Fiscal Impact Analysis. It has to do with the average assessed value of property um, on the one hand, that is non-residential versus on the other hand, everything combined. And there is a refinement coefficient based on empirical research done by these professors at uh, Rutgers University. Um, the, the upshot of this is that the Township expenditures attributable to existing non-residential development come to just shy of $2.5 million, or about 32.5% of the township expenditures. So to determine the expenditures for the proposed development, we also use the proportional valuation method with a different refinement coefficient. 
uh, and we come to a projection of annual expenditures for the township at least of $62,585, which translates to $32 per thousand square feet of development. Then we have the township revenue, which is in the middle panel of the spreadsheet, which is the, in the very back of the fiscal impact analysis. The first source is the real estate tax revenue. The township has two funds which have real estate millages totaling 0 0.12 mills applied to the assessed value of 96,444,000 brings us a projection of $11,573 in real estate tax revenue. Earned income tax revenue is determined by taking the number of workers and the average annual salary. The, the township has a tax rate of 1%, 1.0% for non-resident workers. But then we have to assume that the vast majority of these workers are going to live in municipalities that charge the earned income tax. And therefore, Euclid Township is going to collect the tax, but then ship that money back to these municipalities where these workers live. The township, I project, will be able to keep only about 10% of the earned income tax revenue that it collects. So that comes to 62,000, excuse me, $63,683, which in itself, the one single revenue source of earned income tax revenue exceeds the annual township expenditures for the pro proposed development. The largest revenue source will be the local tax, uh, services tax re uh, re revenue, rather. That's $47 per worker per year multiplied by the 1,640 workers. That comes to $77,000 per year. Actually, I think it will be a little bit higher than that. I'm conservatively uh, projecting uh, 77,000 because again, there will be part-time workers and there will be uh, turnover within positions, meaning that more people, more workers will actually pay that tax. Uh, there's some additional revenue from franchise fees and miscellaneous revenues. Most of that is the franchise fee. Uh, that comes to $25,343 and uh, $3,957 in interest earnings. The total township revenue comes to $181,616, which translates to $94 per thousand square feet. So the net township impact, which is the revenue minus expenditures, is projected to total positive or surplus $119,030 per year or positive $62 per thousand square feet. So annual revenue is projected to be nearly three times the annual expenditures for the township. This annual surplus of about $119,000 represents the value of 0 0.08 mills in real estate tax township, in real estate uh, tax rather throughout the township. In other words, with this development, the township would be in a position or could be in a position sh should it choose to do so of actually reducing its township tax rate by a certain amount and still uh, wind up with enough revenue from the entire township, including this development, to cover its costs. Um, if you have any questions now, we'd be fine, or we can go into the school district if you like. Yeah, well, David, why don't you uh, discuss the um, annual Downingtown Area School District expenditures and funds? This, this is going to be a lot easier. Um, because the, the, the school district expenditures obviously are going to be zero. Uh, there are no school kids coming out of this development. There are no direct expenditures from this proposed development. So the expenditures are zero. The revenue is the real estate tax using the school district's tax rate of 27.1820 mills. This one revenue source generates $2,621,541 in annual revenue to the school district. There is no earned income tax revenue because the district cannot tax the uh, earned income of non-residents, only the township can do that. There is some local service tax revenue. The school district has a tax rate of $5 per worker. So that comes to $8,198 every year. There is no state and federal revenue because there are no students. And there is some additional earnings on investments of $20,549. So the annual school district revenue from all sources comes to $2,650,287 or $1,374 per thousand square feet of development. And again, because there are no expenditures, every dollar of that revenue becomes surplus money to the school district. 
that surplus, 2.65 million, um, translates to uh, almost 1.2% of the net school district expenditures. So we have one development in the school district covering more than 1% of the annual school district budget. Uh, this also equals uh, almost a half a mil in real estate, uh, real estate tax throughout the school district. Again, similar to the township, the school district could conceivably reduce its tax rate uh, throughout the township for all properties, including the proposed development after it's built, and wind up making the same amount of money. And of course, it will not need to uh, make more than that because there are no school district expenditures from this proposed development. Uh, so combined, the two impacts, the township and the school district impact total a surplus every year of $2,769,319, which translates to $1,436 per thousand square feet. Uh, because this is largely because of the school district uh, uh, net impact, uh, the combined revenue is projected to exceed the combined expenditures by more than 4,400% every year. And David, uh, what's on what we're seeing on the screen is um, Mr. Ott's review dated August 18th, 2020. Yes. And he uh, offered um, pretty much two comments. And the one was also in reference to the uh, case study method to be used and that you use the proportional valuation method. And he indicates in our experience, these two methods both of which were developed by the Rutgers University Center for Urban Policy Research are appropriate when evaluating non-residential development projects and produce similar results. So we therefore have no concern that the study does not use, utilize the case study methodology. And that's what you were just talking about in the beginning of your testimony, correct? Yes, I, I, I agree with, with Ray. Um, Ray is a colleague and a, and a dear friend. Um, I, I would disagree though that, that the the case study method and the proportional valuation method find the, the same results. They do with larger developments, that is true. With very small developments, there's sometimes a disparity, but that's because of the, uh, uh, we'll call them the eccentricities of the uh, proportional valuation method for very small developments. A small mom and pop store very often has uh, wildly overstated um, uh, township expenditures associated with it using the proportional valuation method. It doesn't really, uh, concern us with this development because it's obviously not a small one. So uh, your comment there, uh, your opinion in reference to that wouldn't, would not affect this development because of, uh, how, okay. That is correct. And then he also discusses the demographics. Can you just touch upon that? Well, the demographics, as I mentioned, are from the, uh, you know, the source, uh, which is the, the Rutgers University crowd. Um, there are some other sources of demographics um, they, they're, they, they wildly differ because um, demographics for most non-residential developments um, are, are in flux and, and many of these types of businesses are changing their, their business models. Uh, I, d I haven't seen anything that, that I would rather use than the 2005 or 2006 study, which is the, the national figures from the Rutgers University crew. Um, not for industrial, at least. Office development, I think, uh, that's changed a little bit, especially with back office types of uses. Um, retail can vary a little bit, but for industrial development, generally speaking, a little bit less than one worker per thousand square feet is a, is a pretty safe bet. And in your opinion, is the proposed development a benefit to the township and community based upon your fiscal impact analysis? Yes, it is certainly uh, a, uh, favorable for the township, but it is, it is exceedingly favorable for the school district. The school district is by far the big winner here, largely because of the assessed value and the fact that the school district has a significantly higher tax rate than the township. The township gets most of its revenue, more of its revenue from other sources than the real estate tax, but the school district gets the vast majority of its revenue from the real estate tax, and that's why it becomes the big winner in this uh, for this development. That's all the question I had, Mr. Babbitt. Thank you, um, Mr. Buck. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Right. Does the uh, board or staff have any questions? 
I just had a, I had one quick question about why um, park maintenance wasn't included in the fiscal impact study when there will be a park there that will require maintenance. Well, I didn't include it because the proposed development being non-residential in nature, you know, people work there, they don't use the township parks, at least not very much, not like township residents do. And therefore there are no direct expenditures um, for uh, park maintenance and operations. Now, given the fact that there is a park or there's proposed to be a park, clearly there will be some uh, a township um, uh, costs to maintain that. Uh, but I, I believe that the township is going to receive enough revenue, about 181, almost $182,000 each year to cover the expenditures to maintain that park and to do all of the other things that the township needs to do with that revenue, pull up, provide police services, fire protection, code enforcement, and so forth. Anything else? Ted, do you have anything? I, I have one question, um, no. if, if I can. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. The I know Vanguard has has paid for uh, quite a few years a, a reservation fee for the sewer um, and for the sewer hookups, which uh, I believe and Scott I don't know if you remember the amount, but it's it's, it's quite substantial. Um, was that taken into account into the in in this evaluation the uh, loss of that revenue? Uh, no, and the reason is because the sewer fund in total is not included in this develop in this um, um, analysis because the sewer fund, being a proprietary fund, is going to get have its revenue from the uh, connection fees and the sewer user fees. And if the sewer fund doesn't have enough revenue to cover its costs, it's going to raise those fees. It's not going to raise taxes. So it's really a separate analysis. In, in essence, I, I would argue that a sewer fund is. A, a, a pass-through fund. It's a, a dollar going in is a dollar going out, uh, and um, and the, the, the sewer fund should be made whole by this development. And if it's not, then the sewer fund will have to, again, raise its own fees and not the, it can't um, receive any revenue through taxation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had one more quick question. Um, I believe you said 10%. You were, you were, basing your estimate on earned income tax revenue as right. like 10% of the employees. Um, did you take into account, I believe half of that goes to the school district? No, actually not for non-resident workers. It does for residents, but not for non-resident workers. The township's tax rate is 1.0%. The school district does not tax non-resident workers at all under state law. Right, right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else from the board? Ms. Kearney, any redirect? No follow-up questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Babbitt. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kearney, do you want to do your exhibits now or wait till testimony is completed? Um, I can ask for all the exhibits to be admitted. I believe I had, oh, there was a, um, a letter of support from the property owner, which we had sent over to the township, which would be marked Exhibit A-19. Um, uh, yeah, I believe that's it. And I did provide Mr. Buck with a copy of that. It's Nelson Realty, the um, property owner has indicated their support of the application. Mr. Buck, do you have any objection to the admission of Exhibits A-1 through A-19? No, we don't. Okay, then those will be admitted into the record. And is that the uh, end of your case, Ms. Kearney? I did want to recall John Nielsen, one of the Board of Supervisors member, uh, and I apologize, uh, I forgot who had asked it this evening, about, asked about air and noise pollution. And I just wanted to briefly ask him to, a couple questions in reference to that. Okay. You want me to re-swear him in? Yeah, would you please? Okay, Mr. Nielsen, please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You need to unmute. Thank 
get everything. Mr. Nielsen, there you go. Working now? Yes. Uh, I do. Thank you. John, briefly, you had uh, testified at the last conditional use hearing, correct? I did. And I, I believe you had indicated, um, you had testified in reference to um, air pollution. Can you just briefly um, state what your testimony was at that time? Yes, um, Mamie had asked a question about noise uh, pollution as well as um, the environmental uh, effect of, of trucks. And uh, since 2009, there was a, an act passed called the anti-idling uh, rule with tractor trailers. So they can't idle for more than five minutes. And they have to shut off. I'm very familiar with that because I have a truck that happens to be a 2012 and they shut off. The other thing I think that's uh, added to that is uh, since uh, 2010 or so, they added diesel exhaust fluid to the manufacturing of trucks uh, that utilize that fluid to help clarify the air as it leaves the exhaust, uh, including catalytic converters. So most of the newer modern trucks all have the, what I would call the latest federal standard um, emissions. And uh, between that and the auto shutoff, uh, and of course the exciting thing for me is what's coming is all electric semis, which I think will change the be a dramatic impact. Uh, I think that's coming within the next 10 years. They're doing start, they're doing uh, tests right now uh, in Arizona. So this stuff's happening. And uh, so I think the uh, pollution side of this thing is, is, uh, is being monitored carefully by the federal government. And, uh, and I think there's some new technology coming that's going to be good for all of us. And then in reference to the noise pollution, um, has ALD, uh, how has ALD addressed that or is going to address that? We, we uh, took a preliminary look uh, at the perimeter of the property and most of the noise is coming from uh, the turnpike and Route 100. And if there is any uh, issues as relates to noise uh, on the adjacent uh, properties, we're more than willing to take a look at sound walls uh, and buffering to help uh, minimize any of those impacts. Th that's really all the questions I had of John. Mr. Buck, any questions? No, thank you. Does uh, the Ms. Bauman or the board have any follow-up? Um, just one quick follow-up. I, I too am excited about the future of the trucking industry, hope, hoping that they will um, indeed go electric. Um, to Mr. Nielsen, would, would your um, construction plans include uh, electric that would be able to charge the trucks if they, if they uh, did use electric trucks here at this? Um, we'll, so. we'll certainly be looking at that just like we're looking at the solar for the roofs. We're definitely looking at design of the architecture to include a steel structure that will be able to handle the solar and certainly, uh, you know, being able to accommodate charging stations and whatnot would, would certainly be looked at and we can certainly bring that up during our land development process. Okay. That's the only question that I had. Thank you. Anything else from the board? I had a question, Kim here. Do you plan to hire a mechanic on site? A truck mechanic? Can you? Uh, there's certainly many, there's many companies that do service, on-road service, uh, that you can do it on site or you can also do it as part of a fleet management program. Um, I believe last time you had asked about trucks that could, might need to be towed or were on the, on the uh, turnpike or had problems. I checked in locally. There's a there's a company right off your border there to the south on 113 called uh, Crawford that uh, is. Uh, I called them, spoke to them, and they they would love to be part of our, our equation. Uh, they have the uh, equipment and the necessary uh, trucks to help manage uh, tractor trailer towing and uh, maintenance. So it's a good uh, good neighbor, and they're about 2.8 miles away from Sherry and Route 100. So say that again, they currently have equipment to tow big trucks? They do. Yes, they do. They have, uh, I like all that stuff. So you see, I get excited about it, but it's, uh, yeah, they do have them right in their yard right now. They have a big uh, tractor trailer uh, wrecker that can uh, pick trucks up off uh, the local roads there, tractor trailers. So the answer to the first question I posed was you don't have you currently don't have any plans to hire a mechanic to be typically on site. The tenant, typically the tenant takes care of all the fleet maintenance but what you have to realize is a lot of the tenants hire trucking companies to do all the trucking for them and those trucking companies have 
their own maintenance staffs, road service, uh, and also fleet maintenance staff involved. Thank you. Anything else? That's all the questions I had. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Sure. Um, and Ms. Kearney, oh, we did your documents, we did your exhibits. Um, Mr. Buck, uh, you have another witness? We do, if we could call Lee Painter. From before, before we do that, let me just check with Lorraine. Lorraine, would you like a, a break or would you like to, to finish up? Uh, do you think you'll be wrapping up soon, Mr. Buck? Uh, less than 10 minutes. Okay, let, let's keep going. Okay. <clears throat> I think. Uh, no, it, it will be, yes. Okay, Mr. Painter, raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Lee, could you please state your name for the record? And Lee Painter. By whom are you employed? J.W. Pepper. And is that the uh, the tenant at the facility at the uh, around the bend on Cherie across from the proposed warehouse development? It is. And are you also a partner in Pepper PALP, the owner of that property? I am. And Lee, uh, um, how long how long has Pepper uh, been there, and have you been driving the roads in this area? We've been here about seven years, and uh, so I've been driving to this site for. Seven years. I did a quick calculation when you asked me that earlier today. Uh, so I think I've driven Cherie about about a thousand times a year for seven years. So four times, four trips. I, I get my this my trip, one in, one out, four times a day, seven thousand times. And you've also you've been in the air any decades. So even before that, you've driven the. Before that, our, our offices were in Paoli, and uh, at the time I lived in uh, West uh, or, uh, East Brandywine Township, and would and would traverse this area getting to Paoli uh, back before the Exton Bypass. So yeah, I think I've been driving the area since 1986. And, and the uh, the owners of the property and the tenants there, J.W. Pepper. I mean, conceptually. Do, do you have a, an issue with the granting of the conditional use that's requested by Audubon this evening? Not at all. Uh, we're, we're happy to see development. Uh, it wasn't the kind of development we anticipated that would probably occur over there, but I don't think it was the kind of development that anybody expected. Uh, the world changes. We're, we're happy with enterprise. We'd welcome them as a neighbor. We just want to make sure that uh, our concerns, which are mostly mostly traffic related, are are addressed as fully as they can be. And, and could you please express briefly some of the safety and uh, circulation concerns that Pepper uh, has? Well, uh, clearly, as it exists right now, Cherie is is not up to the kind of traffic we're talking about. We've we've seen some of the plans that have been uh, discussed for improvements. Uh, particularly given that the exact sort of tenant is uncertain, we think the traffic amounts are open to question. Uh, we, we believe that the improvements that would be necessary to Cherie uh, would, would be greatly more than we've seen uh, theorized. And uh, we feel that the uh, a very thorough examination of at least truck access, but access from Route 100 makes a lot of sense. We think it makes a lot of sense for Audubon, uh, perhaps resembling what uh, Greg Boja drew up, but there might be others, and we just think that should be fully vetted. And, and the, you heard some of the comments before about uh, this being a principal arterial, um, and I know about how long is the span from the Exton train station up to the graphite mine branch on Route 100? I believe it's a hair over five miles. And uh, the other day, just to prepare for this, I drove both directions uh, with, my, with my camera from 
from Cherie uh, north to 401, so that's a couple townships away, and south to 202 and back, checking uh, speed limits. The, the portion of uh, the art, the portion that's being referred to as an arterial at 55 miles an hour is a mile and a half long. Uh, so there's a very, it basically is only the portion of the road that passes, begins just north of <clears throat> Eagle View, passes the turnpike, passes the property to be developed, passes Cherie and gets to 113. So it's, it's only 55 miles an hour for that very brief one and a half miles. Um, everywhere else north and, well, certainly for all of Euclid, it's 45 everywhere else. Uh, and there, there seems to us to be plenty of space for a sensible intersection between, well, close to the turnpike, but between Eagle View and, and Cherie. We think that makes a lot of sense. And in, in the five mile span that you just described from Exton up to Graphite Mine Road, that five mile span, how many current lights are in that span? I believe there are 17. 17 traffic signals in, in five, roughly 5.1 or two miles. Yes, sir. And, and the, that what Mr. Boja's plan would do would make it obviously 18 in that 5.2 mile span. Yes, sir. And as you testified that it's roughly a mile and a half or so between um, the 55 mile zone is just a mile and a half from Route 113 up to just above the turnpike at Eagle View. Uh, it goes slightly past Eagle View to, I think it's township, but Yes, one and a half miles. And in in, um, in your constant travels on Cherie and Route 100, is the traffic ever really going 55 on that stretch of Route 100? The only place that it's safely going 55 is as it actually passes the turnpike. Uh, it, in any in, at any normal time during the business day, it's not going 55 at Eagle View. And it's not going 55 at Cherie. Um, it, it basically is, it, it more or less has to stop, particularly at, at, at the rush hours. So no, if it's going 55, I can speak mostly to Cherie. I, I am not up to Eagle View every day. I'm at Cherie several times a day. And um, frankly, it, it ought to be reduced to 45 now for safety purposes. Uh, right. And, and the, the current configuration of Cherie and its curves and bends and, and entrance onto Route 100, there are existing safety issues with that to begin with, is that correct? Yes, sir, there are. Uh, it's, I mean, you could, you, could, you could make Cherie capable of supporting the trucks, but it's still a very windy road. The sight lines are poor. Uh, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not a good idea for truck traffic. Okay, and then just to, to wrap up, so you you are not, the, the Pepper partners and the folks at Pepper are not opposed to the development of this property by Audubon and Mr. Nielsen, but it's a concern to fully evaluate and assess the conditions to mitigate any further degradation in service along the roads. Is that correct? That, that is correct. I've, I've met John Nielsen. He's, he's a gentleman. He has been very cooperative explaining his plans and showing us his site. And uh, we'd look forward to having him as a neighbor. Uh, and frankly, I think that uh, an intersection on 100 would be to his advantage as well. Thank you, Mr. Painter. I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Kearney. I think she was saying no questions. Oh. Did I? I'm sorry. Yes, no questions. Okay. How about, uh, does the board have any questions? I don't have any questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Painter. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any more witnesses? No, we, we do not have any. And I do not have any more witnesses. Okay. Mr. So both, both parties rest. Um, We've covered the exhibits. Let me just conclude with, with a few uh, final remarks. Um, the Board of Supervisors has 45 days to prepare a written decision. Uh, the written decision will be mailed um, to the address of the applicant um, and any other parties. 
Uh, it may be um, presented if, if time permits within the 45 days at um, a um, township meeting in December. Um, an appeal may be filed in the Court of Common Pleas of Chester County within 30 days of the written decision. If no appeal is filed, the decision of the board becomes final. Um, so with that, we will close the record and close Mr. the Pree, hearing. Uh, Mr. Pree, could I have two quick comments? Yes, I'm sorry, okay, go um, ahead. That's okay. One, uh, can we uh, submit proposed uh, findings and conclusions to the board? Uh, Ms. Kearney, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was muted. I'm not muted. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Uh, the timing of it, I just want to check on that. And, and yeah, I, I think... I, obviously, we don't have the transcripts, which also, and I don't want to put um, an overdue burden on the court reporter. So let me ask... Lorraine, when, when do you think you might have the transcripts for the, the two nights? The first night is done. And okay. uh, this one, you know, I would have it within two weeks. Okay. Um, my, my only concern is I don't, if, if it takes two weeks to get the transcript, I don't know if, if a week once the transcripts come in is enough time for you. I don't want to put too much pressure then on the board and staff to develop an opinion based on your, you know, I obviously want to take your um, work product into account if we're going to do it. Um, yeah, I, honestly, Mr. Free, we, I mean, we don't have a lot of issues here. We're, we're obviously focused on a principal concern. I mean, we'll, we'll do our findings now and we will submit them within five days after the transcript if that helps time wise miss carey how's how's that sound for you i'll get it done <laughs> well i mean let's i, I don't want to a week yeah, no, i'm you know. happy if miss kearney has a little more time than that to look at ours and prepare hers that's fine i just i made the request we'll get it in first yeah so let's see if 40 um I just taking a quick look at the calendar. Um, so shall we say, um, if we say Friday, November 20th, which is a, about, I think 10 days or so, nine days. And that would also give the board and I want to, Tara, do you have any thoughts on this? So 45 days is December 11th, I believe. What, I'm kind of confused as to what you're looking to submit. I mean, the decision is usually based on the testimony and the exhibits presented. Yeah, I, I think what he's suggesting is he would provide us with proposed findings of fact, conclusions of law, which we could use if we agree with them or not use if we don't agree with them. I mean, you're welcome to submit. Yeah, so, so, what, to the township. Yeah, so why don't we say um, if, if you have that done by... Our supervisor's meeting on the 9th? Well, I, I was... So we have to wait two weeks for the transcript, mm -hmm. which would be the 10th, right? Do I have that right now? Yes, third, yeah, two weeks from tonight would be the 10th. We could say, the 20th. Uh, I'm sorry? The 20th? Yeah, I don't know that I, I would probably say, um, let's say Wednesday the 18th. Okay. Is that right simultaneous? Are you all right with that, Ms. Kearney? Yes. Okay. So we'll say the the 18th um, and then the 45 days would be just on my quick. Would 
would be Friday, December 11th, I believe would be 45 days. So that should still give us a couple weeks to, to develop the opinion. Everyone, Tara, you're okay with that? Yep. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, um, and the record's closed. Uh, any other comments or questions? Ms. Kearney, are you gonna get a copy of the transcript? This is Lorraine. Yes. <laughs> so you want copies of both nights? Yes. And Mr. Buck? Yes, please. All right, terrific. Thank you, everybody. And, and uh, again, we're sorry for the delay between the two hearings and I'm glad we were able to get it done tonight. Thank you very much. I look forward to working with everybody here. Thanks all. Have a good evening. Thank you.